So, um, so I'm Larry Karen. I'm the Vice Provost for Research. And um, it's, a, it's a real honor to, to do this today. And, and, um, and, uh, and, and what, what it is, is is honoring one of our very finest faculty for a, for a very distinguished honor. So I, I think that this honor is, is certainly a, a, a honor for Warren and Professor Grill. But uh, it's, it speaks about Duke and about the type of work that we're doing here. So um, I, was, I was personally very excited about it, and I, and I thought we should, we should celebrate it. So um, I'm going to say a few words about the Javits Prize itself, and, and then uh, uh, Dean uh, Trusky is going to say a few words about Warren, and then we'll have Warren. Okay, so, um, so the, the Javits um, Neuroscience um, Prize is, is actually named in honor of uh, Senator Javits, um, a Republican from New York who um, uh, died of um, ALS in um, 1984. And so um, this, this honor was actually created by the U.S. Congress. And um, uh, it is, it's been in existence since 1984. And um, the honor um, is, is a seven-year research grant given, and this I'm now quoting, uh, is given to a scientist for their superior competence and outstanding productivity. Um, the Javits Award is a long, provides long-term support for exceptionally talented, imaginative, and preeminent scientific um, investigators. And, and that, that really speaks to, to Warren. And so um, this is a tremendous honor, Warren. We're extraordinarily proud of you. and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, thanks, Larry. Let me just say a few words about Warren for, as an introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with him. First of all, he got his uh, bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Boston University and then did his PhD uh, work at um, Case Western. Uh, and after his PhD, he started on the faculty there at Case Western. Um, and then after a few years, he started looking around for other opportunities uh, and uh, decided to come to Duke. I was fortunate. I was uh, actually chair, just starting chair when uh, Warren signed. I'll have to admit that uh, it was Mark Friedman, the previous chair, who did all the heavy lifting and get everything set up. But it was really nice to, first thing to do is to, to send out the offer to, to Warren and have him send it back. And, um, you know, I think uh, one way to describe Warren is, is really simply amazing. I mean, he not only is an outstanding scientist, um, he started several companies, um, and he is also an excellent teacher and, and mentor. Just to give you an idea, he's um, a Bass Fellow. Um, he has received the Scholar Teacher of the Year Award at, for the university last year. That's, that's the entire university gives out one award for that. He also received uh, the previous year in 2013, the Outstanding Postdoc Mentor at Duke. He's a fellow of the Biomedical Engineering Society and of the American Institute for Biological and Medical Engineering. Uh, so um, his, his research, uh, you'll hear a little bit about, does deal with deep brain stimulation, uh, functional elect electrical stimulation of, of the nervous system. As, and it's not only um, applied work, he's also trying to understand basic mechanisms so that they can develop, he and his lab can develop better methods to improve um, uh, 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 movement and uh, other disorders affected by uh, problems with the nervous system. So, uh, Warren, uh, this is a great honor, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much, George, and, and thank you very much, Larry, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's a, a real thrill to, to have the opportunity to give this lecture. And I think uh, a little bit about the geography, I think one of the things that enables success uh, here at Duke for, for people like myself is the geography. And we are sitting right now at kind of the nexus between the engineering campus that's right across the street and the medical center that's right over here. And one thing you'll see come out during the course of my talk is the ability to take advantage of that geography and walk from one location to the other, interact with our colleagues. And uh, that allows us to do things that might be very, very challenging at other institutions. So, uh, you know, some people might say that, you know, this award is humbling. In fact, after an introduction like that, it's, it's just the opposite. But I'm fortunate that my, my family is here, including my two teenage children. They certainly humble me. And then, uh, I don't know if you noticed on the way when you walked in, but you, you walked past a display of the Nobel Prize, and so that's also fairly humbling. But before I start, I'm required to make some uh, disclosures of financial conflicts of interest. As Larry indicated, I'm actively involved in the formation of new companies, 
And today I'll be talking about some novel methods of brain stimulation. And I'm an, a, I'm an inventor on those patents. And like most institutions, Duke will share the revenue that accrues from those patents with the inventors. So I could benefit financially from those patents. As well, I'm, I'm a share owner of Deep Brain Innovations, which is the company that has licensed those patents. Can you see my pointer? OK, great. So for some people, this slide is a problem. But in fact, if you have a job like I do and you don't have this slide, I think that's really a problem. Because what we claim to be trying to do is to develop innovations that impact healthcare. And in the United States, healthcare is a for-profit enterprise. And the way that you will impact that is through commercializing the innovations that you develop in the lab. And that is not a passive process. It requires effort, time, and energy on your part. And through that effort, time, and energy, you're going to end up with financial conflicts of interest like I have. I'd also like to uh, just say a couple words about Senator Javits, for whom this uh, award is named, to add a little bit to, to Larry's introduction. I thought it was interesting that uh, Professor, ja uh, Professor Javits, Senator Javits is referred to as a liberal Republican. And so it shows you uh, the unfortunate turn that we've taken in this country since he served uh, through, this, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I don't think there's anybody out there today who could be referred to as a liberal Republican. And I thought it was quite telling that he was awarded for his service as a senator the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1983. So I'm going to be talking to you today about a treatment for Parkinson's disease. So I'll begin by introducing the, uh, Parkinson's disease and tell you a little bit about the medical therapies that are currently used to treat Parkinson's disease. This gentleman has Parkinson's disease. And um, uh -oh. I even came over here on Friday to test this. Let's try one thing. So you can see from the pictures that Parkinson's disease does not discriminate by, by race or by age. And it's characterized by things we can see, movement disorders like this, including tremor, rigidity, difficulty walking. Uh, you'll see this kind of classic shuffling gait. But then there are other features of Parkinson's disease that we don't see, uh, neurocognitive deficits, depression, and those things are not influenced uh, by the, the therapies that I'll talk about today. So the only thing that brain stimulation can influence are the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So current treatment. Let's go here. Everyone's worst nightmare, right? We will try again. So what causes Parkinson's disease? Well, it's the death of a certain group of cells in your brain. Those cells are in an area of the brain that's been called substantia nigra. Substantia nigra means black stuff. So you can see these guys, these old uh, anatomists, really were, were quite creative. And these cells make a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is necessary for e efficient voluntary movement. And you can see from this uh, post-mortem brain slice at the bottom of the slide, on, the, on your right is a uh, brain stem from an able-bodied person, and the substantia nigra is the, the black stained uh, neural tissue. And on the other side is, uh, you see the, an absence of that staining in a person with Parkinson's disease. So those, those nerve cells have died, and there's no longer dopamine available in the brain. So the first course of treatment, uh, like in the case of many uh, brain diseases, is to try to replace the lost dopamine. But dopamine will not cross the blood-brain barrier, so people take a pill called L-DOPA, which is a metabolic precursor for dopamine, and then your brain turns that into dopamine. And the advent of dopamine for the treatment of Parkinson's disease was, was really quite revolutionary, and is captured both in a very good book by Oliver Sacks called Awakenings, and a not as good uh, movie, movie by the same name. 
So this shows the impact of dopamine on motor function in a person with Parkinson's disease. This is a motor test of, of tapping rate. So a neurologist will ask the person with Parkinson's disease to do this as fast as they can and count how much they can tap over time. So this is over the course of a, a full day here. And you see at the top indicates when they take their dopamine medication and their ability to tap gets better. They speed up, so they're tapping very quickly. And then as that dopamine wears off, their tapping speed declines. They get this classic symptom of slowness of movement or the inability to move. So they take another pill and that speeds them back up and they can again tap and of course do other things beyond tapping. Then the pill wears off and they again slow down. So the portions of their day that they spend in different conditions are uh, characterized over here on the right. So half their waking hours are in what's called off. That is not enough dopamine and unable to move efficiently. A quarter of their hours, shaded here in yellow, are spent in a condition called on with dyskinesias. So there's too much dopamine. They move a little bit too much. And I'll show you some examples from, of that, but if you've ever seen Michael Fox on television when he has an appearance, he will take a lot of dopamine before his television appearance because the last thing he wants to do is slip into an off state and it looks like he kind of has ants in his pants because he just has too much dopamine on board. So that would be on with dyskinesias. And then in yellow here is just on, able to move efficiently with no dyskinesias. So this is an example of a patient uh, who was treated here at Duke by my uh, colleague Patrick Hickey. And this is an example of severe dyskinesias. And you can see these are kind of uncontrolled movements as a result of, of too much dopamine on board. And you can imagine that this is completely disabling. This gentleman is, is confined to a wheelchair because he's unable to walk as a result of these dyskinesias. So this standard of care that is taking this pill is an effective way to turn people from off to on, but it then pushes them into this state, particularly after they've taken this drug for many, many years, into this state of on with dyskinesias, too much dopamine on board. So this is the same gentleman. This is now two months after he has had deep brain stimulation. In addition to making him look somewhat like Ben Carson, you see that it's had a dramatic effect on his dyskinesias. Involuntary movement is gone. He's able to now initiate voluntary movement. And you'll see in a minute he can get up out of his wheelchair and walk. In the pie chart is shown the same distribution of how people now spend their day, but with deep brain stimulation on. So now 75% of the waking hours are on with efficient movement and no dyskinesias about 20% of the day off, and only a very small portion of the day on with dyskinesias. So quite a dramatic impact on uh, the, the quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease. This is the same gentleman that I showed you at the beginning. Here's the video we saw without deep brain stimulation. This is now deep brain stimulation turned on. You can tell it's the same day because he has the same shirt on. He's here uh, making one of my favorites, peanut butter and jelly. And one of the most dramatic parts of this video is coming up. You'll see him walk down the stairs while he's putting his jacket on. So no evidence of postural instability. The only bad news for him is uh, this is a patient who was treated in Cleveland. He now has to shovel the driveway. <laughs> so I really like this quote from Nathaniel Hawthorne, recent discovery of electricity and other kindred mysteries of nature seem to, seem to open paths into the region of miracle. I mean, these are miraculous changes that are occurring for individuals who are receiving deep brain stimulation. What I hope to do in the remainder of, of the talk is to kind of take that miracle out of the box, so to speak, and help you to understand a little bit how is this working and what are we doing to make it work better. This slide illustrates the underlying technology of what you can think of as a brain pacemaker. So entirely analogous to a cardiac pacemaker, except the electrode is placed into the brain rather than into the heart. So there's a surgically implanted uh, electrode down into the brain, and I'll show you that in a little more detail. A subcutaneous lead wire that runs under the skin to a battery-powered pulse generator that's in the chest. And then the clinician can program the prescription or the output of that stimulator using a radio frequency link. The stimulation is on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And if you turn it off, as we saw in the video, the symptoms come back and they come back remarkably quickly, and then if you turn the stimulation back on, the symptoms will again go away. 
For the electrical engineering aficionados in the, in the audience, these are very, very short pulses, about 100 microseconds in duration. They're delivered at relatively high frequencies, about 150 pulses per second. And the device controls the output voltage, and the electrical load is about a kilo ohms. So there's about a 3 milliamp pulse going into the brain, which is a fair amount of current. Deep means deep. These show the surgical targets to treat tremor and two other targets that are used to treat tremor, slowness of movement, and the, ability to, uh, and the inability to initiate movement. And this is a cross-section of the brain in this plane, although actually I should stand like this, in this plane, where on this side is the front of the brain and on that side is the back of the brain. And you see that these targets are roughly in the geometric center of your head. And the black line shows the electrode to scale. So this is a fairly large electrode that's being introduced into the brain. And these surgical targets are about the size of a raisin or the size of an almond. And you can't see them, right, because they're inside someone's head. So how do you get the electrode there? Well, they put a, a, a fixture on your head that looks something like this. I've heard some of the surgeons describe this to potential recipients as, well, it's like going to the dentist and having a filling. Uh, it's, a, it's a little more significant than that. They use magnetic resonance imaging to take a picture of your brain and use those preoperative images to plan a trajectory to introduce the electrode into the intended target. And the coordinates for that trajectory can be navigated using this frame. So there are little markers placed on the head before imaging, and then you fix the frame onto those markers so everything is, is registered in the same map, if you will. And then they introduce the lead down into the brain target. Even though these electrodes are quite large, they're remarkably well tolerated in the brain. This shows post-mortem material from an individual who died uh, from causes unrelated to deep brain stimulation. You see an x-ray illustrating the two leads down into the brain. In most individuals, symptoms are on both sides of the body, and so you need to stimulate both sides of the brain. Here's the hole left behind when the electrode was removed. And this shows a close-up of the tissue around one of the contacts on the electrode lead that was stimulated for over two years, and tissue around an adjacent electrode contact that delivered no stimulation at all. And what's quite remarkable is that even after a couple of years of stimulation, there's really no apparent difference between these two brain sites, meaning that you can deliver chronically electrical stimulation of the brain without damaging the brain tissue. So deep brain stimulation is an effective therapy for a number of movement disorders, including essential tremor, tremor in multiple sclerosis, although the effects there seem to wane after about five or, six, five or six years of use. I showed you some examples of Parkinson's disease. It's also used to treat dystonia, another movement disorder, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder, a neuropsychiatric condition. And there are ongoing clinical trials in epilepsy, depression, Tourette syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, um, and a number of other smaller, not yet reached the clinical trial stage, but smaller clinical studies, feasibility studies, and a number of other disorders. And remarkably, even though this therapy has now been implanted in over 100,000 people worldwide, we still don't understand how it works. So the underlying mechanism of action is not entirely understood. So I think this quote from Bertrand Russell really describes quite well where we are. We know very little, and yet it's astonishing that we know so much, and still more astonishing that so little knowledge can give us so much power. That is, even though we don't quite understand how this therapy is working, you see these miraculous uh, benefits and, and treatments that can, that from, from which people can still benefit. So what I'd like to do now is uh, tell you about our efforts first to understand how deep brain stimulation works, and then use that understanding to innovate the therapy, to make the therapy better. And I'll take you through a, a series of both computational studies in a computer model, as well as translational studies into human subjects, again, facilitated by the geography here at Duke, then back into the computer model to use it as a design tool, back into the clinic to see if what we designed actually worked, and then at the end kind of give you what I think is coming next here. So one of the real hallmarks of the effects of deep brain stimulation is that the treatment of symptoms is very strongly dependent on the rate at which the pulses are, de are delivered or the stimulation frequency. So these are examples. This is a woman who has essential tremor. So the size of her tremor is plotted as a function of the stimulation frequency. And this horizontal line shows you the baseline tremor with no deep brain stimulation. 
If you stimulate with low frequencies, here about less than 50 pulses per second, you see that the tremor actually gets worse. And it's only when the stimulation frequency exceeds about 100 pulses per second that the tremor is suppressed. These show similar data, but in persons with Parkinson's disease. This is what's called the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. It's a Simon Says-like test that neurologists use to evaluate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And the higher the number, the worse the symptoms. So you see, with no stimulation, the black bar, the average symptoms are about a 46. Stimulate with low frequencies, 10 pulses per second. The gray bar, the symptoms actually get worse. And it's only when the stimulation frequency is turned up, in this case to 130 pulses per second, that the symptoms were reduced. So we wanted to try to understand why is this true? Why is it that you have to stimulate at such a high frequency in order to see the uh, effects on symptoms? So to do that, uh, two students, an undergraduate, Andrea Snyder, and an MD-PhD uh, student, Svetlana Miocinovich, developed a computer model of a cell in the human thalamus, a portion of your brain, again, is roughly in the geometric center of your head, and studied how does that cell respond to deep brain stimulation. So what's illustrated here is the re a recording of voltage as a function of time. And this shows you the activity that you would have recorded from a cell in the thalamus of a human with a central tremor. And if you listen to this cell, you would hear and it's bursting. Each one of these is a burst of signals synchronously with the tremor. So we made the computer model cell do the same thing. It's bursting synchronously. There's no tremor in the computer, but it's bursting in the same pattern as the experimental cell. Then we delivered low frequency deep brain stimulation, 20 pulses per second. And you see the original bursting activity and superposed on top of that new signals that were created by the stimulator. Those are these other vertical lines called action potentials, the, the language of the nervous system. Then if you turn up the frequency to 100 pulses per second, you see quite a profound change. Now the original burst signals are gone, and they've been replaced by constant firing being paced by the stimulator. So the cell is just firing it along at 100 pulses per second. Every time the stimulator stimulates, the cell fires an action potential. So to quantify this, we measured how irregular is the activity of this nerve cell. And that's plotted here, irregularity of neural activity across stimulation frequency. The gray line shows the irregularity that just results from this bursting activity. Stimulate with low frequencies, and you actually make things more irregular because you've introduced new activity with the stimulation pulses. But if you turn up the frequency high enough, all the, all the irregularity goes away because now the stimulator, excuse me, the cell is just firing in lockstep with the stimulator at whatever frequency you tell it to. When, I, when Svetlana brought this curve into my office, you could imagine how excited I was because it looked remarkably similar to the curve that I showed you earlier of symptom as a function of stimulation frequency. Stimulate with low frequencies, make the symptoms worse, and only when you stimulate with high frequencies do the symptoms get better. In the model, stimulate with low frequencies, make the cells fire more irregularly, and only when you stimulate with high frequencies and eliminate that irregularity did you effectively treat symptom. So this gave rise to a hypothesis that effective deep brain stimulation depends on the ability to regularize the firing of those neurons. And that's how it's relieving the symptom. Just a hypothesis, right? It was built in a model. So we wanted to test that hypothesis. And we came up with the idea of delivering random patterns of stimulation. If indeed it's required, it's important to regularize the firing of the neuron, if you stimulate them randomly, it shouldn't work. However, we had a problem. Because while we wanted to apply random patterns of stimulation, the implanted pulse generator that these patients have in their chest can only deliver regular frequency stimulation. So we had to come up with some way to make random stimulation. And we took advantage of the fact that these stimulators are powered with primary cell batteries. And that means they have to be surgically replaced. And we came up with a way to make temporary connection to the implanted brain lead while the surgeon was replacing the battery depleted stimulator. This work was largely done by Brandon Swan, a research and development engineer in the lab, in collaboration with Dennis Turner, who's a functional and stereotactic neurosurgeon here at Duke, and has been enormously generous with his time and energy in the operating room to allow us to do these experiments. 
This is not part of the normal course of treatment for people who are undergoing battery change, so we have to get their consent to participate in our studies. About a third of the people that we approach consent to participate in our study. Of those that consent, about two-thirds make it through the protocol. It takes about 40 minutes for them to do the whole experiment, and a number of them get part, part way into the study and say, I don't want to do this anymore. It turns out that the best subjects are old ladies. They are most likely to make it through the, the protocol, and young men are the worst. So we have a biased sample here of mostly old ladies. And I'm always hesitant to say it, but uh, we have had no post-operative infections or other complications as a result of participating in our studies. So we now had this way to deliver random patterns of stimulation to the brain of patients who are undergoing battery change. This is done under a local anesthetic, so they're awake and we can interact with them. But we needed a way to assess their symptoms. We couldn't have them get up and walk around in the operating room. And so we have them alternately click the two buttons of a mouse. And they're instructed to click as rapidly and as regularly as they can the two buttons of that mouse. And these show example trials. Each one of these is 30 seconds long of this mouse clicking. So when the trace is blue, it means their index finger is down. When the trace is red, it means their middle finger is down. And when the trace is green, both fingers are down. So here's a, just a single trial with deep, deep brain stimulation off. You see most of the trial, their index finger is stuck down in this particular subject. That is, they have akinesia. They're having a difficult time moving. Turn on deep brain stimulation, and you see nice alternation between red and blue. Their symptom has been relieved, and we can quantify that by actually measuring how rapidly and how regularly they're clicking the two buttons of the mouse. This uh, ability to quantify this was done in collaboration with Helen Bronte Stewart, who's a neurologist at Stanford, and uh, Mandy Miller Coop is a research assistant in her lab who helped us figure out how to make these quantitative measurements in the operating room. So we had a way to deliver stimulation. We had a way to measure the effects of stimulation. What happens when you deliver random patterns of stimulation to the brain of someone with Parkinson's disease? So this illustrates the, the patterns that we delivered, all at high frequency, because as I told you earlier, you have to stimulate at a high frequency or it's not effective at relieving symptoms, but with differing degrees of randomness. This shows the change in movement speed relative to baseline, where green is baseline, stimulate with regular 130 pulse per second deep brain stimulation, and they click much faster. You've treated their bradykinesia. But as you make that pattern of stimulation more and more random, you see that their movement speed declines, and in the most random conditions, it's no different than no deep brain stimulation at all. Random DBS is not effective at treating bradykinesia. Similarly, if we measure how variable their movement is, you see with no deep brain stimulation in green, they have highly variable movements, long blues, long reds, short blue, short red, highly variable. But with high frequency DBS, movements become much less variable, but as you make that pattern of stimulation more and more random, it loses effectiveness. And these experiments were led by Chuck Dorval, who was a postdoc in the lab and now is a faculty member at the University of Utah. So these data led us to the conclusion that random stimulation was not effective. High frequency is not sufficient. All those patterns were delivered at 130 pulses per second, but only those that were regular were effective at relieving symptoms. And this was consistent with this hypothesis that the effects of deep brain stimulation are to regularize the patterns of activity in the neurons, and it's through that regularization that DBS treats symptoms. However, I'm an engineer, and what got me even more excited from this result was the observation that effective deep brain stimulation does not just depend on frequency, because all of these were at the same frequency. It depends on the pattern of stimulation. And that gives us a new parameter that we might be able to exploit to make the, make the therapy better. So now I'm going to tell you about how we sought to design novel temporal patterns of stimulation where we actually change the timing between the stimulation pulses as a way to either increase the efficacy, that is do a better job at relieving symptoms, or, and what I'm going to focus on today, improve the efficiency, make the batteries last longer. Because while this battery change is beneficial to us, it allows us to do experiments, it's not a great uh, thing for the patient. As I told you, these batteries last only three to five years. So if you install a deep brain stimulator into someone who's 50 years old, they might undergo four, five, or six battery changes during the course of their life. 
Each one of those is a cost between $25,000 and $30,000. Also, when you replace that device, you run the risk of incurring an infection, just like with any other surgery. And there's a surprising incidence of misprogramming. In particular, since there's a lead on both sides of the brain, the surgeons will sometimes plug it into the opposite hole on the stimulator. So your right side will, give your, will get your left side program, and your left side will get your right side program, which can be corrected, but it requires that the patient come back and again see their health care provider to get the right program installed in their brain. And as I suggested, if we can increase the lifetime of these, so this shows the cycle length, in this case for an implantable drug pump, but the same kind of data would be true for deep brain stimulation, the longer you make this last, the greater the cost savings relative to conventional medical therapy. If you have a device that just lasts a couple of years, it's more expensive to use the implanted device than conventional medical therapy, make it last longer, and you actually incur a cost savings. So we wanted to make these, exploit the pattern of stimulation to make deep brain stimulation more efficient, reduce the amount of energy that's required. But if you think about changing the timing between these pulses, where you're delivering something like 100 pulses every second, that means you have 99 different interpulse intervals. How do you pick them? Should you have a whole bunch of short ones and then a long one, or a whole bunch of long ones and then a short one? There are many, 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 many combinations of interpulse interval that you could imagine using. So one of the challenges we had to address is how do we select the timing of these pulses? Well, we took a nod from nature. That is, we used an approach called computational evolution. So the giraffe didn't know that it had to make its neck longer. Right? This just happened organically. Over time, the giraffe's neck got longer so that it could reach leaves on taller trees and outcompete the other giraffes who had shorter necks. We can take this same idea, except in our world, the organisms are not giraffes. They're temporal patterns of stimulation pulses. And the objective is not to make the neck longer. The objective is to relieve symptoms with as few pulses as possible. Make this as efficient as we can. So in this world, we start with random patterns of stimulation. We run them through a model of the brain. And that model of the brain gives us a measurement which is strongly correlated with symptom. So we can, from that model, say this pattern of stimulation is going to or is not going to be effective at relieving symptom. That gives us a way to, to gauge their fitness. How, how high on the tree can they reach? We then mate those patterns, just like giraffes would mate. We introduce random mutations, just like in real evolution, and we add immigrants to keep the, the gene pool rich. And we run around generation after generation, optimizing the timing of those pulses to make them as effective and efficient as we possibly can, in the same way that the giraffe neck gets longer to reach leaves high on the tree. So this shows that happening. So this is our measure of fitness, how effective and efficient are the patterns. This shows it over the course of about 100 generations. And for our de definition of fitness, by the time we've uh, completed evolution, we've reached an optimal pattern of stimulation. We then wanted to take that pattern developed in a computational model and test it in persons with Parkinson's disease to see, is it indeed effective at relieving symptoms? So we took advantage of the same interoperative approach where we can make temporary direct connection to the brain lead. We had patients doing the same alternating clicking of the two uh, buttons of the mouse. These show example data from single trials. So here's no deep brain stimulation. You see this in, in this individual, the middle finger is stuck down for most of the trial. They have severe symptoms. Stimulate with regular, in this case, 185 pulses per second deep brain stimulation. Nice alternation between red and blue. And with our optimal pattern, delivered at an average frequency of 45 pulses per second, only one quarter the number of pulses required here, it looks like it does just about as well as the regular deep brain stimulation. These show group data across a, a, a population, all of whom have Parkinson's disease, all of whom are in uh, getting deep brain stimulation and having their batteries replaced. This is a measure of how slowly or irregularly the person is clicking the, the buttons of the mouse called bradykinesia. And this is on a logarithmic scale, so these are very large changes. Here's with no deep brain stimulation. Stimulate with conventional high frequency deep brain stimulation, see a significant, significant reduction in symptom. Stimulate with our pattern, 
at one quarter of the frequency, and it does just as well, but it does so with a 75% improvement in efficiency. That is, we require many fewer pulses per time than with conventional deep brain stimulation, but do just as good a job at treating symptom. So what will be the impact of this? Well, we took the battery lifetime estimator that's provided by the manufacturer, and we plugged in our uh, pattern and used that to estimate how long the batteries in the device would last and compared that to how long the batteries would last with their conventional programming that they had already. So in this light blue, I think this is indicative of, 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 a, of teams that are ranked number one uh, at the beginning of the season. You see that the, the battery lifetime is somewhere between two to five years, right? Averaging maybe three or four years, as I told you earlier. In this darker blue, indicative of teams who are ranked number one at the end of the season, you see the battery life predicted what are optimal patterns of stimulation. And for most patients, we get at least a doubling of battery life, changing from three to five years out here to seven to ten years. So now you're going to cut in half the number of battery replacements that individuals require. So to summarize this, computational evolution enabled us to design these optimal temporal patterns of stimulation. And those novel patterns treated symptoms with the same efficacy as conventional stimulation, but did so with much greater efficiency, roughly doubling the battery life of the implanted pulse generator. So what's on the docket next? Well, we'd like to continue the evolution of these optimal temporal patterns of stimulation. As I described, there are a number of different symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and these symptoms are expressed differentially both across individuals, so some people have lots of tremor, some have very little tremor. They also vary during the course of the day, or they may vary according to what the person is trying to accomplish. And so we'd like to develop symptom-specific patterns of stimulation, where you could treat if somebody has predominantly tremor, you focus on treating predominantly tremor, or if they have predominantly slowness of movement or disruption of gait, you focus on what is most important to the patient. As well, in our studies so far, we used a single model of the brain. And that model was just representative of a generic person with Parkinson's disease. Well, these are not generic persons. In fact, I heard a neurologist a couple weeks ago say that if you've met someone with Parkinson's disease, you've met someone with Parkinson's disease. Each patient has their own little differences and quirks. And so we'd like to take advantage of that and actually design patterns that would do optimal symptom reduction in individual patients. And then finally, take advantage of the opportunity to dynamically change these patterns during the course of the day. It may be that when someone is sleeping or walking or at work typing on their computer or cooking dinner, they can use different patterns. And you could imagine that according to how well they want their symptoms relieved, they could move between a pattern that's very efficient but not that great at relieving symptoms, say when they're at home watching a football game, versus a pattern that's maximally effective at relieving symptoms but requires a lot of energy, as they might want to do, for example, if they're walking their daughter down the aisle at her wedding. And the patient would have the opportunity to trade off between efficiency and efficacy. And then finally, we have the opportunity to take advantage of optimal, of these temporal patterns of stimulation to treat other neurological disorders as well. And this is the part of the talk that should really scare the younger people in the audience. I've just picked a couple of examples these show prevalence of neurological disorders in the United States, chronic pain, headache, tinnitus or intense ringing in the ear, depression, uh, degeneration of the part of your eye that turns light into signals to your brain, stroke, Alzheimer's disease. These are enormous problems today. And as you can see from these curves, which show you the number of Americans 65 years as older and older as projected in the purple bars, Many of these disorders and diseases are age-related. So we're just seeing the leading edge of these problems. I described for you at the beginning the use of pills to treat Parkinson's disease, but pills will not save us. So these show the years to approval for new medications to treat central nervous system disorders. For CNS disorders, about 10 years, about $900 million, and Fewer than 10% of compounds that enter phase one toxicity trials make it all the way through to approval. This is not just my opinion. If we listen to some supposed experts, 
Andrew Witte, the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, in a press release where they were disinvesting in research and development, he said, pain, depression, and anxiety are areas where we believe the probability of success is relatively low, and we think the cost of obtaining success is disproportionately high. Therefore, we're no longer going to pursue this. Even more disturbing, Tom Insel, who is the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health until about two weeks ago, this is the part of the federal government who is charged with coming up with therapies to treat nervous system disorders. He states, there are very few new molecular entities, very few novel ideas, and almost nothing that gives any hope for a transformation in the treatment of mental illness. That's abominable. The person whose job is to lead the charge to treating mental illness says there is no hope. That to me is very scary. So pills will not save us, but devices might. The treatment of diseases and disorders that affect the central nervous system represent the most exciting area in the life sciences, and medical devices represent the most elegant solution to many of these problems. This is a, a Wall Street investment bank who clearly was trying to raise some money for a company that was developing medical devices, but nonetheless captures the sentiment that these devices are an alternative to the conventional way that we think about treating nervous system disorders. And I'd like to close by giving you an example of that and how else we can take advantage of temporal patterns of stimulation. So one of the, on the top of this list is chronic pain, an enormous problem not only in the United States but worldwide. And there exists a treatment for chronic pain called spinal cord stimulation. This is a permanently implanted pacemaker, much like what I described for you with deep brain stimulation, except instead of the electrodes going in the brain, they go into the spine outside of the spinal cord, and they deliver electrical stimulation to block the pain signals from moving from the spinal cord up to the brain. These show clinical data with conventional spinal cord stimulation. This is a pain rating scale that's used to measure pain because we have no objective metrics. You just have to ask the patient where this is the most excruciating pain you can imagine and no pain at all. So in this group of patients, they were at about, a point, they were about an 80. So this is fairly significant pain. And then this shows after they've received spinal cord stimulation, their pain is reduced by about half. And that pain relief persists out to at least two years. So their pain is relieved by half. And this shows the proportion of patients who got at least a 50% reduction in their pain, which was considered the threshold for clinical effectiveness. And about half the patients in this study got uh, reached at least 50% reduction in pain, where those that just got conventional medical treatment, fewer than 10% got at least a 50% reduction in pain. So the moniker for this therapy is it works half the time and half the people. So we thought about, well, can we take advantage of this same idea of changing the timing between the stimulation pulses as a way to improve the therapy of spinal cord stimulation for chronic pain in the same way that we did to improve deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. And I won't take you through the design process, but I will show you some of the outcomes. So these, uh, this work was done by uh, Chang Zhang, a, a, a PhD student in the lab who graduated last year and is now contributing to, uh, is now a taxpayer, so success for all of us. He recorded from single cells in the spinal cord and this, you can think about the firing rate of this cell, how many signals it's firing per second, as being a proxy for pain. This shows the firing rate of that cell as a function of time. So you see it's firing at about 50 spikes every second. Then we turn on spinal cord stimulation. The firing rate of that cell goes down, or you would, you would imagine that you would get pain relief. You would no longer feel pain because that cell is not signaling pain up to the brain turn spinal cord stimulation off, and that cell resumes firing. The pain signal comes back. So what's illustrated here for conventional stimulation, the way it's currently practiced in the clinic, and for our novel pattern stimulation that we invented using the same kind of idea of changing the timing between the pulses, is the change in the activity of these pain transmitting neurons. So with conventional stimulation, you reduce on average their firing rate by about 30%, so you would feel less pain. With our novel pattern stimulation, you do about twice as good. That is, you reduce their firing rate by 
projected to produce additional pain relief. And if we take this difference and project it, this is just a projection, these are not real data, project it onto those clinical studies, we see a dramatic effect. Rather than just getting a 50% reduction in pain, these individuals get closer to a 75% reduction in pain. And rather than only half of them getting effective pain relief, closer to 70% of them would get pain relief, simply by changing from conventional stimulation to these temporal patterns of stimulation. So nervous system disorders are a significant challenge. It's unlikely to be addressed by pharmaceuticals alone. Pacemakers for the nervous system are a promising therapeutic approach. And these novel temporal patterns of stimulation are an innovative approach to improve, I showed you both the efficiency of stimulation as well as the efficacy of stimulation. I'll close with this quote from Michael Faraday. Wonderful as are the laws and phenomena of electricity when made evident to us in inorganic or dead matter, their interest can bear scarcely any comparison to that which attaches to the same force when connected with the nervous system and with life. This is a really exciting place to be working, and I feel extremely fortunate to have the opportunity to do this work. I think I acknowledge most of these individuals during the course of my talk, but I'd like to, to, to uh, give a specific acknowledgement to our clinical collaborators here at Duke, uh, Dennis Turner and Nan and Ladd, both in the neurosurgery department. Uh, Bob Gross, who's a neurosurgeon at Emory. It's only six hours to get to Emory, so we drive down there and do experiments at Emory as well. Steve Tatter at Wake Forest, that's even closer. We drive over there and do experiments. When we show up in the operating room, we are just there to make the procedure longer. There's no benefit to the patient. There's certainly no benefit to the physicians. Uh, and there's certainly no benefit to the residents, who are usually the least happy people to see us out of the whole group. So we're extremely thankful to the cooperation of our clinical collaborators. And I'm also grateful to the, the uh, financial support from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you. So um, we're going to have a reception back here, but if there are any questions anybody would like to ask quickly. Yeah, so the question is, in the introduction, I talked about the idea of using uh, deep brain stimulation not just to treat Parkinson's disease, but to treat things as diverse as Alzheimer's disease or epilepsy or depression. And the question is, are you targeting the same region of the brain to treat these different disorders? And the answer is no. So there have been two, well, really three approaches uh, that have been used to identify where in the brain should you put the lead for stimulation. The first was called chasing the lesion. So historically, these same brain targets that I showed you in that cross-section were lesioned by surgeons. So they would put a probe down into the brain and literally cook and kill those neurons. But what they observed in the course of lesioning, if instead they applied stimulation in the operating room, they saw a relief of tremor. And that was the inspiration to try DBS. So one way people have, have figured out where to put the lead is chase the lesion. If a lesion works, then maybe deep brain stimulation will work as well. The second, and this was the uh, inspiration for the target in depression, was to use functional brain imaging. So in this instance, positron emission tomography, which actually measures the metabolism of the cells in your brain. And you can see which cells are active under certain conditions by how much glucose they use. So you inject radioactive glucose, and you can measure where that glucose is being utilized in the brain. And they measured this in patients who had depression, and then in patients who were effectively treated by pharmaceuticals, and then they saw where is activity changing in the brain, and let's target that with deep brain stimulation. And then the third way, and this was the target uh, for Alzheimer's disease, which is an area called the fornix, was actually just a serendipitous observation in a, uh, by a surgeon. They were actually targeting a portion of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is one of the things the hypothalamus is involved in is regulation of feeding, how much, how much you're going to eat. And they were interested in treating morbid obesity. So they implanted a lead into what they were thought was the hypothalamus. As I, as I described to you, you don't always get it into that raisin or almond. It's a hard target to hit. But in fact, one of the contacts ended up in the fornix. 
And when they stimulated this individual's brain, he had vivid recollections of events from his past as if they, as, as if they were happening right there in the operating room. And he could describe everything about them. And so this inspired the surgeons to say, well, part of the problem of Alzheimer's disease is an inability to recall events from the past. Why don't we put an electrode into the fornix and stimulate and see if we can help people recover memories who have Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is maybe. It's an ongoing study. We don't yet know the results. It's fully enrolled. And so the, the, I think the public release of those results will be in the next few months. And we'll know whether or not it's an effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, Henry. Yeah, so that, that's a, a great question. So, so the question is, are the patterns that we have found through this evolutionary algorithm, are they similar to the pattern that these cells would be firing normally if, if a person didn't have Parkinson's disease? And the answer is no. So one thing that's a little bit unusual about this therapy in general is you think about an able-bodied person has some pattern of activity in those cells, right, which allows us to go about our, our, our daily day and is very involved in control of movement. That pattern changes in Parkinson's disease and disrupts the ability to move. You can then stimulate it, say, at 130 pulses per second. And as I showed you, then all those neurons are firing synchronously with the stimulator 130 pulses per second. That clearly is not the normal pattern of activity of those neurons. Yet, when someone has that device, they can play tennis, they can dance the jig, they can touch their nose, uh, so it relieves symptoms. And similarly, the patterns that we've arrived at through our evol evolutionary algorithm also do not look like the activity that you would record from those neurons in an able-bodied person. Okay, um, Warren, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to have a reception right in back to you. Congratulations. Thanks, Larry.